It's exciting to live in a state where over 90% of our land is privately owned. And the stewardship that you use and live every day uh, is a signal to the rest of the world on how to grow an economy. Uh, if you've ever owned a rental property, who takes care of better, your, better of your property? You that own it or somebody that rents it from you? There's no better stewardship of someone that has a financial vested interest. And that's what we need to uh, really celebrate here today and what's being done. I certainly appreciate Trinity Waters, uh, Ken, and uh, Texas A&M AmberLife Extension and the host for bringing us together because 86% of Texas is considered rural still, but 88% of our population lives in an urban area. And so making certain we have that connectivity with the millions and millions of Texans that are removed from land ownership and removed from land stewardship it is, a, is an important element of keeping Texas the kind of state that we can be proud of, making certain that we have policies in this state that enable private land ownership to continue and that um, laws are not passed that erode the value of your property. Now, Texas has done a lot of work in the last few years to help restore some rights that have been eroded uh, through a series of adverse court cases, through um, loopholes in the law. As a matter of fact, the Kelo decision woke Texans up uh, when our United States Supreme Court said you can take private property uh, for economic development purposes. And Texans changed our constitution here a few years ago. Land steward organizations stepped forward uh, and we, we, we put that in our constitution. As a matter of fact, because of that, on the heels of that, we recognize some things that were statutorily wrong with our eminent domain system. Landowners stepped forward, and we had an opportunity to pass Senate Bill 18, which I stood right beside Governor Perry in his office when he pinned that bill into law to make certain that in the event that eminent domain had to be used, landowners' rights were put in the front of that process and not the back. Uh, we know that if you don't stay forever vigilant, things slip away. I guess y'all heard about the young man that grew up on his family's ranch, uh, went off to college, got married, married a city girl, moved into town, was living in the city, going back to his office one afternoon, and this gentleman approached him, and he was a dirty, stinky, smelly, grimy, homeless person, came up to him and said, say, mister, do you have any fair change for some dinner. And a man reached in his pocket was going to give him ten dollars and said, wait a minute, before I give you this money, are you going to take it and go buy beer with it? The man said, I gave up drinking years ago. He said, well, if I give you this ten dollars, are you going to take it and go fishing? He said, fishing? He said, I haven't been fishing in, you know, 20, 30 years. He said, well, if I give you this ten dollars, are you going to take it and go hunting? He said, you must be crazy. I, I don't know. I can't even remember the last time I've been hunting. Man put the money back in his pocket and said, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to give you this money. I'm going to take you home. I'm going to introduce you to my wife and my family and I are going to cook you the best meal you've ever had. And the man said, you must be crazy to get, take a guy that looks and smells like me to your house. That will probably infuriate your wife. He said, you know, it probably will. I just think it's very important for her to see what a guy looks like who's had to give up drinking, fishing, and hunting. <laughs> It's good to have a reminder sometimes of all the fun things you do outside, isn't it? You know, as our state grows and it continues to have 26 million people today to 50 million people uh, in the next five to six decades, what we're experiencing right now is a very good reminder of how we need to continue to encourage the private ownership of property and how we need to connect with urban Texans and let them see the good stewardship practices that are enhancing water quality. The good stewardship practices that are stretching our water supplies. And if you don't tell the story, other people are going to be telling it. There was a group that had a press conference in Austin at the beginning of this legislative session. And they had a big poster up there that were naming water hogs. And they named agriculture as the biggest water hog in Texas. But what they didn't have as a part of their presentation is that agricultural water use has declined by 42% from 1974 to 2010. 
What they didn't tell in that story is that their yields on cotton has been phenomenal during that time period. The yield on corn has gone from 30 bushels an acre 50 years ago to over 100 bushels an acre today. What they didn't say was that the meat produced per animal unit for beef cattle has doubled since the 1960s. We have a very powerful story to tell. If we're not telling that story, others will be telling it, and they won't be giving the information that is so needed for policymakers to make decisions. Now, our state climatologist said the other day that officially the drought that we're in is the second worst drought record behind the drought in the 50s. But what makes this drought so particularly bad is that we had a drought of 05 to 06. In 07, we had a little bit of a reprieve. In 08 and 09, we were back in it, and then we got a little bit of relief. And then in late 2010 through the present day, we're in the drought that we're in today. Our water reservoirs statewide are about 59% capacity, even after the recent rains that we've had. I've talked to one school district in Vernon County that had been hauling water for a year to their facilities because their water intake had dropped so low. As Commissioner of Agriculture, we've probably given emergency disaster grants to over 24 communities in the state because they were virtually out of water. If you were a farmer or rancher in the Rio Grande Valley today, you are battling two types of droughts. One of them is a natural drought, and the other one is man-made. Because there was a water treaty between us and the country of Mexico in 1944 to decide how to divide the water, and Mexico has not been living up to their end of the bargain. And so those landowners are suffering double over the difficulties that we face today. We know that the construction of new reservoirs has met with great resistance around our state. I appreciate the Texas of the 50s building reservoirs, though, don't you? Because if they hadn't, just think where we would be today. Even with our water capacity as tight as it is, the Texans then recognized they needed to be bold, they needed to develop water resources, and they didn't. And now the question is, what will the Texans of 2013 do as we move forward? Well, there's a lot of different options on the table. And at the Department of Agriculture, I was contacted by nurserymen uh, in early January of 2012. They had been contacted by the North Texas Municipal Water Supply, who said, we are about to engage mandatory water restrictions not only has the drought devastated our water supplies, but the Army Corps of Engineers has said we cannot release water from Lake Texoma because of an invasive species called the zebra mussel. I guess I need to correct that. The Corps said you can release water from Texoma, but you have to be liable for the, all the ills of mankind for the next 300 years if you do it. Because if the zebra mussel is detected in any other water source, then the liability was just instrumental. And so the nurserymen, the Retailers Association, uh, we got with uh, uh, retailers, uh, Scott's Miracle Grow was a big leader, Home Depot, Lowe's, Kroger, uh, and others. And they said, well, how can we address this immediate crisis that we have? And I said, it's simple. Let's hold a press conference and just announce it how bad things are, and we've got to restrict our water usage and get out of this. And they said, please don't get up and say that. So let's go to the market and let's test messages on what will actually move people to conserve water through a voluntary basis. And so they went through and developed and, and, and several different messages, about 30. And they did a survey, just like you would if you were to roll out a new product about what messages move consumers to actually conserve water, recognizing that water that is conserved is the least expensive form of water that we have. And so as a result of that, they developed TexasWaterSmart.com, and my agency was a part of that. Uh, and TexasWaterSmart.com is a consumer education campaign that we've carried around the state where the 88% of the people live 
and, and encourage them to use these voluntary water conservation tips that has resulted in measurable savings. We have over 300 entities statewide now that are partners in TexasWaterSmart.com. More and more are coming on every day. I'm encouraging chambers of commerce, Rotary clubs, Lions clubs, FFA chapters, uh, it, uh, all different types of entities to take up this cause. Because if we can conserve water, we postpone and delay very expensive projects that end up impacting private landowners. Uh, Tarrant Regional Water Supply has indicated because of water conservation efforts uh, in their area, they have been able to postpone major water projects by about 15 years. So that's 15 years of your water rates not going up. 15 years of land being taken for new water projects that has been delayed. 15 years of uh, making certain that an asset we have, we really maximize. These, these issues are so important as we move forward because we know we don't have the water capacity. And you all have a real decision to make as voters and taxpayers this November. You have nine constitutional amendments on the ballot. Proposition 6 is probably going to be the one that's most talked about. Um, Proposition 6 takes $2 billion out of the state's rainy day fund, moves it over to the Water Development Board that's been reconstituted here recently, and puts it in a fund that will allow water entities to access those funds to be able to get water projects up and running faster. Now, there is some contention about this because there are conservative groups in the state that are afraid that the legislature is going to start running to the rainy day fund for any kind of project that's out there. They also believe that we know we've been in a water crisis. We should have been spending and planning accordingly from our general revenue fund and not waiting and just running to the rainy day fund. I think it's very important that a rainy day fund not be used as a slush fund. I think it's very important to safeguard those dollars for what they're really there for, a time of major crisis and disaster, which we have in Texas in hurricanes, in wildfires, uh, in tornadoes. But folks, if there ever was a disaster, this drought is one. 2011 alone, they had over $8 billion in ag and timber losses alone. Uh, we continue to have impacts with the shrinking cattle numbers. Uh, Plainview, Texas had a Cargill plant that closed. 2,000 families displaced because those jobs were eliminated. And so I've been telling people I'm going to vote for that. I wish we would have done it differently as a state and been a better planner. We weren't and the rainy day fund balance is healthy enough that it'll be safe to make this movement, in my opinion, and of other money managers in the state. But you get that final say. The good news about this, it does not create any indebtedness for the state of Texas. Um, now, these dollars will be used by local entities, but I'll tell you, no water, no jobs. And I do a lot of economic development work in Texas, and I meet with industry that wants to relocate to Texas, I meet with existing businesses that want to expand. Have any of you ever served on a site selection committee of a business wanting to move into your community? It doesn't matter what industry there, there is, there's always a lot of questions. And when I've been meeting with industries, it doesn't matter who they are, there's always two common questions on every site selection committee's form. One is, what is Texas going to do to have an educated, skilled, and trained workforce? Very, very important. And secondly, what is Texas going to do to meet its water needs? Folks, I think we need to remove the question marks when people are looking at investing in Texas. And the only way to do that is to be vigilant in making certain that we're developing the water resources that we need. And I, I, I can bet you a dollar that no one in here gets a water bill that has the state of Texas at the top of it, do you? It's not the state's responsibility to actually develop and manage these water resources, nor should it be. Water managers do that. 
But the state has a role in planning. The state has a role in research. The state has a role, I believe, in making low-cost financing options available so projects can get up and running quicker. Water conservation is a good message for the state to help partner and to push through a consumer education campaign in partnership with private industry. Desalination is more feasible today than it ever has been because of low-cost energy supplies. Uh, new technologies are continuing to lead the way. There's a smart field technologies that's being developed out of love. They tell your plant to water when they measure the temperature around the canopy of that plant. And they have had field trials that have been phenomenally successful using substantially less water because of this technology. Uh, Village Farms grows tomatoes in greenhouses. And y'all remember a few years ago when you buy into a tomato, you knew it was a greenhouse grown tomato, right? Today, the quality of the fruit is phenomenal. Village Farms has 30 times the yield of tomatoes in their greenhouses over field grown tomatoes using 86% less water. It's phenomenal what they've done. I've gotten a letter that, from a gentleman that wanted me to uh, help promote his project. I thought about investing in it. Wouldn't be right for me to promote it as ag commissioner. Anybody have a lawn sprinkler system at your home? And it works off of a timer. You tell it to come on at 3 o'clock in the morning and shut off at 6. I've even have a rain sensor on the side of ours. Been hanging down, I know. Right? It hadn't been a big problem because it hadn't been raining a lot before recently. He has technology that it's called IDD, but what it does essentially, it measures the soil moisture content of your yard and grass. And it tells your sprinkler to come on not on a timer system, but on a when your grass really needs a drink. Technology is going to be the solution to where we go. But continuing to encourage good private land stewardship, land ownership, carrying forward the heritage of our great state. At the Department of Agriculture, one of the most uh, enjoyable things that we do every year is to honor families that have had land in their family for 100 years or more that's been in continuous agricultural production. Anybody been recognized family land heritage here today? I tell you, that's the most meaningful thing that we do. Red Steagall still comes down. Uh, volunteers his time because he loved Texas so much and uh, honors those families. And I'll tell you, you know it's meaningful when somebody passes away and I, they send me their obituary, the family does, and in the obituary it says that this gentleman was honored by the Texas Department of Agriculture for keeping their family's land in their family and in continuous ag production for 100 years or more. That's who we are as Texans. That's what defines us. Who we are as Texans in the future is going to be determined by those of you here today and the actions that you take. We have some tremendous partners that are represented here today that work together in, in an extremely beneficial way. I appreciate the partnerships uh, with you all to move our state forward, and we have a long way to go.